أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمة وقل رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا ربكم أعلم بما في نفوسكم إن تكونوا صالحين فإنه كان للأوابين غفورا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we're talking about the importance and value of regard for our parents and I've chosen of the many ayat that are dedicated to this subject uh, probably the central ayat are from Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17. And these are ayat 23 to 25, uh, dealing with the subject. Allah Azza wa Jal begins and He says, وَقَضَى Rabbuk, Your Lord declared, أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ That you will not be enslaved to anyone except Him alone. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And in regards to both of your parents, the best possible conduct. Those of you that are from Persian or Urdu or similar backgrounds, have one common misconception. Oh, a lot of the words in the Qur'an are also in Urdu, so I know what it says. I know the meanings. Well, you know, it so happens that a lot of the words in similar languages, like Turkish or Urdu or Persian, that are influenced by the Arabic language have similar vocabulary, but they mean different things. They don't mean the same thing. So just because you know what the word means in English, or in Urdu, or in Farsi, it doesn't mean you know the word in... Arabic, okay? Just to give you an extreme example of that, just so the matter becomes absolutely clear. In the Arabic language, Allah uses in the word, uh, the, the, a word in the Qur'an, dhalil, dhalil. If I use this word in Urdu, you'd be offended. And in Qur'an, Allah uses the plural of it, in Arabic, the plural of dhalil is adhilla. And He uses it for the Sahaba. وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ adilla. Allah aided you at the time of Badr while you were all Conclusive, you know, uh, collectively, adhilla, meaning weak, powerless. So the word dhalil in Arabic means powerless, weak, incapable of helping oneself. This is what it means. But in, in another language, it may be very, very, very offensive. And the reason I bring this up is the word ihsan. Ihsan, because um, I think my first language is Urdu, so when you think of the word ihsan, you're thinking of a favor. Right? Now Allah says, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانَ with both of your parents have ihsan, which means do them favors? No, it actually has nothing to do with doing them favors. It means to be the best at something. Ihsan in Arabic is excellence. It has nothing to do with doing favors. It has to do with doing your best. So Allah is demanding from us nothing short of our best when it comes to our parents. What that means is, you have a potential to be good, or to be patient, or to be merciful, or to have kind words, or to be charitable. Right? Or to have courtesy. The best of your courtesy, the best of your words, the best of your patience should go to who? Your parents. So of the good characteristics you have, the peak of them, the highest of them, who does it who who does that who's deserving of them are your parents. But he says this of course after he mentions himself. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا the, the ayah begins, your Lord declared that you do not enslave yourself to anyone except him alone. And then he immediately went to the parents. And look at the high standard that he set for us. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Now there's other places in, in Quran where Allah says husnan. You know, instead of the word ihsanan, he uses the word husnan. Husnan is more general, good. And generally speaking, you have, to, you have to have an attitude of good towards your parents. But with ihsan, with the use of this word, ahsana, to be the best, or to, to, do ex, to excel with sin, it raises the bar between us and our parents. Now the other thing I want you to focus on is actually the use of the word here, walidain. The singular of which is walid. And there are two of course, walid and walida. You heard both of these words before, walid means father, and walida means mother. And there are two other words for mother and father in Qur'an. There's ab 
And then there is um. There's ab and there's um. So you've got four words now. Walid and walida, and you've got ab and you've got um. Ab and um are more respectable terms than walid and walida. Ab and um in Arabic are at a higher level. And the way that linguists describe the difference, walid comes from walada yalidu, which means to give birth. Meaning your physical father and your physical mother, they are walid and walida. But Ab is a little more than that. Ab is someone who didn't just father you physically, he's not just biologically your father, he actually contributed to your upbringing. He provided for you, he took care of you, he protected you, etc. etc. So he graduates from Walid and becomes Ab. So not every Walid is necessarily a good Ab. Right? But every Ab is a Walid. So Ab is a more specialized subset. So what's the higher term, Walida or Um? Um is the higher term. Now another place in the Quran you will find, Allah Azza wa tells us to be good to both parents. And then He says, حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ We gave man a legacy in regards to both his walid, both his walidain. And then He says, حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ He switches the term. He doesn't say, حَمَلَتْهُ وَالِدَتُهُ He says, حَمَلَتْهُ Umhu. So he begins with the word walid, but he doesn't use the word that goes with walid, he, use the, he uses the word um. And the reason for that is that the mother has already contributed. When she carries the child, when she delivers the child, when she feeds the child, she's not just a physical mother anymore, she's already contributed something towards the child. So she's automatically earned the status of um. But the father may not have necessarily earned that status, right? And the wisdom in, this, in these ayat is Allah uses the word walidain. What that teaches us is, we have to be the best to our parents, and especially our father, whether he was good to us or not. You know, whether Muslim or not, good to us or not, kind or not, merciful or not, courteous or not, he was there for you or not, it doesn't matter because Allah used the word walid. You know in modern society, you're not good to your parents, or your parents say, why are you so mean to me? And you turn to your dad and you say, well you weren't there for me. <laughs> what did you do for me? Right? When I was little, I remember you didn't used to take me to the park, blah, 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 and now I'm leaving you at a nursing home. So, <laughs> there's this reciprocal mentality. What you do for me, I'm going to do for you. But by Allah Azza wa Jal using the word walidain, there's no reciprocal mentality. If, there, if He fathered you, He deserves the best of your conduct regardless of how He, how he is to you. Subhanallah. This is a very high principle in our deen. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرِ even if it be the case that they reach, even if it be the case that they reach in your midst, old age. أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا One of them or both of them. And Allah specifically mentions subhanahu wa ta'ala older age. Why? Because as people get older, one their expectations become more. When your, chi your children are little, you don't expect too much from them. When they spill some water, they say, okay, it's a baby, what are you gonna do? Right? When they get a little older, you say, why did you spill the water? And then you get a little older and you say, go buy the water. <laughs> right? So you, your expectations with your child get more and more and more. And so it's natural that the child can become more agitated with the parents because they're demanding more and more and more. Also naturally with aging, Allah says, وَمَن نُعَمِّرْهُ نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ Whoever we give old age, we reverse them in creation. And one of the interpretations of that ayah is, you know, old people become more and more childish. They become, you know, uh, stubborn like a child would. They become emotionally volatile like a child would. Right? They become harder to deal with like a child is sometimes. You don't know why they're angry, you can't reason with them. Right? And you might feel less like that sometimes with your parents. So when they reach this old age, it's a particular challenge. One of them or both of them. And especially in those circumstances, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ then don't even say uf to them. In other words, uf, like I mentioned before, uf is the expression in Arabic for the show of frustration. We can't even show our parents that we're frustrated. Whether they're yelling at us, whether they're saying things that are fair or not fair, whether they're insulting you, it doesn't matter what they're doing. That's not the point. You're not showing them respect because of them. You're showing them respect because it's a command of Allah. Number one. Number two, you're showing them respect because no matter how much harm they do to you, psychologically or physically even, no matter how much harm they do to you, you can never, they can never outdo the good they did for you. The good that your mother did for you, for example, can never be outweighed by anything she says to you or does to you. 
if those of you that have had children, those of you that have seen your wives go through the difficulty of labor and carrying a child and delivering the child and then feeding the child and staying up night after night through her own sickness for the child, they, these are the people that appreciate their mother all of a sudden. You see your wife in the ER and you say, SubhanAllah, this is what my mother put up with? You know? And then after she's done delivering this child, going through pain, after which Allah forgives all of their sins, imagine that. It's not something cheap what they go through, right? And our mothers go through that for us. And then they, after they're done, it's not like they get a two-week vacation. You've just had surgery, you know. You go to work and you, get, you break an ankle. Or you know, you burn a hand or something. You get a couple of weeks off, you know, you know, you know physical leave, medical leave. The mother doesn't get a medical leave of absence. She just delivered the child 40 minutes ago, now she's got to feed the child. And the first time it hurts like bleeding. She's got to get to work right away. <laughs> no vacation. And she's got to stay up and feed the child and take care of the child endless, without any fall, any break whatsoever. Wallahi, people think they have a hard time. Men think that they do a lot when they go to work and they earn a living, right? I would rather stay at work 12 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours than take the job of a mother for even one day. <laughs> because what they do, if you have kids, you know this. If the wife leaves you with the children, with your two kids or one child for three hours, you will say, SubhanAllah, I've never put in more work than this ever in my life. <laughs> you know, and they do this on a daily basis. On a daily basis. And they continuously do this without ever turning around and saying to the child, you know, I've put in 20 hours in the last two days for you. So how about a little minimum wage even? Nothing. They ask for nothing in return. But they do, in the end, feel that they have some authority, some respect, they deserve something over this child. And rightfully so. Look at what they've done for us. But what happens is, when you and I become teenagers, we become hot-blooded, because we figured out the whole world. We know everything that's right and everything that's wrong, and nobody can correct us, because we're on top. And so your mother comes and says, why are you home late? I told you I was going to go out with friends. Come on, I told you, it's not my fault. You're always blaming me. And you slam the door in her face. You walk away. And then you're IMing your friends or text messaging them nowadays. Man, my mother, she just keeps yelling at me. She doesn't understand me. And the other one says, yeah, my mom, my parents actually got a funny accent. You got to hear them talk. And then you, your mother calls, what are you doing? Nothing, homework. Right? Because I can't relate to my parents. They're, they're just from out of this planet or something. So we've got no regard for our parents. And just imagine, these are the same parents that put up with us so, you know, endlessly put up with us, with nothing but love for us. But we just, one thing doesn't go our way, and forget it. And it starts even at childhood in our society. Just by the way, side parenting advice, don't take your kids to Toys R Us or KB Toys or anything like that. Never. If you want to get your kids something, go get it yourself and then bring it home. Because if you take them to the toy store, then there's about a hundred thousand pieces of merchandise that they didn't bring home. Right? So as they're leaving the cash register, they're going to see a candy bar, and they're going to see another video game that you didn't buy them. So they're not going to remember what you bought them. What will they remember? What you didn't get them. You're, you're teaching them, your children, you're teaching them ingratitude from, from childhood. Oh man, they didn't even get that for me. Oh come on, that's not fair. I only got the cheap one. Right? So we don't, it's just consumer society. That's what they want you to do. Toys stores are designed by design. Stores are designed to make you want to leave with something more. So you will notice, if you just do a little bit of experiment for yourselves, go to a toy store and hang out there for a couple of you know, minutes, you'll see kids leaving the toy store crying. No child leaves the toy store happy. Because <laughs> there's always something back there. So this, this mentality is brewed even from childhood. So as kids become adults, oh, my dad bought me a cheap car. You know? I mean, he's, he's not paying all of my tuition, he's only paying 85%. I don't know what he wants from me. You know, he only bought me one pair of sneakers this year. Now the, the parents, the children are trained to complain about things they get, rather than be grateful. This ummah is an ummah of gratitude, right? But we're turning to an ummah of complaints from early childhood. And we're doing this to our kids. We have to understand, we can't expose them to this kind of mentality. And there's ways to, you know, be actively involved in the upbringing of our kids. Anyway. I come to you in old age or uh, one of them or two of them. فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلٍ كَرِيمًا Don't abandon them and speak to them in gracious, respectable terms. Don't reciprocate anger with anger. 
Don't reciprocate frustration with frustration. Don't reciprocate loud voice with loud voice. Whatever they use, it doesn't matter. You respond with respect. You respond with gracious words. With gracious words. You know, there's a quick story. My teacher always tells this story, uh, Dr. Abdul Samir. When he's giving this, uh, teaching this ayah, so I'll share the story with you. It's actually pretty interesting. There was this boy, and he's about three years old, and he's walking with his dad in the park. Okay? And they're walking in the park, and the boy sees a crow on a tree. And he says to his dad, Dad, what's that? And he says, it's a crow. And he says, oh, okay, dad, uh, what's that? And he says, it's a crow. And he asks him again, Dad, what's that? It's a crow. And now they go past it, he turns around, Dad, what's that back there? He says, it's a crow. He asked him like 20 times, what's that? And, it's, and he says, it's a crow. And the father thinks it's funny. So he comes home and he writes it in his journal today, my son asked me 20 times about a crow. Right? And he thought it was cute. So now he's not three anymore, 30 years go by, he's 33. And he lives in a different city, he's got his own family, own problems. Dad calls him one day, I want to come over for the weekend. Oh, I'm busy this weekend, we're going on a picnic. But okay, if you have to, then fine. Do I have to pay the ticket? <laughs> so the father comes early in the morning. The father says, let's go for a walk. Is there a park nearby? I'm, I gotta get to work, but it's the weekend. I know, but I had some other plans. Okay, fine, let's go. Fine, fine, just for five minutes. Now they're going for a walk, and they see a crow. And the father says, son, what's that? It's a crow, dad. Son, what's that? My goodness, I told you it's a crow. I sent you glasses last month. Is the prescription running out already? What's the matter with you? Is this funny? And he asks him a third time and says, you know what, I'm not talking to you anymore. And so the father pulls out his journal. And he shows it to his son. And he says, you asked me what a crow is 20 times. And I responded with a smile, you couldn't handle three. Right? And so, I mean, it's just a story. But it tells us something about our temperament with our parents, right? So Allah says, وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And then He uses these profound words. The Qur'an is full of imagery. Just incredible images. Allah says, وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Lower for them your wings of mercy. Your wings of shade, out of mercy rather. So the, each part of this ayah is important. First of all, lower for them, meaning lower your ego, lower yourself. And then the, the words used are wings. We don't have wings, but the image is that of a bird. When it protects its nest, what does it do? It puts its wings, its most precious asset. It puts it in front of the nest. If you want to attack something, attack my wings. Don't attack my nest, right? So Allah is telling us to lower our wings of shade, to cover our parents out of one sentiment. Mina rahma, out of mercy. No matter what your parents do to you or say to you or what you feel about them, the number one motivation we should have towards our parents is mercy. And that's a commandment of Allah Azza wa Jal. Wahfid is a command, fi'il amr. Lahuma janaha dhul mina rahma. And while you do this, while they're hurting your feelings or yelling at you and you're convinced that they're wrong, while they're doing all of that, you make dua for them in private. Wa qul and say, Rabbir Hamhuma. My Lord, have mercy on both of them. Have mercy on both of them. Now notice these words. You don't even say, Rabbi ghfir lahuma. My Lord, forgive both of them. Because then you would be implying that they're doing something wrong to me. Allah, I want you to forgive them. for. But Allah tells us to say, show them mercy. Don't even attribute wrong to them. Ask Allah to show mercy to them. And then you ask to, in reciprocation, because we can never, we as human beings can never pay back what our mothers did and what our fathers did for us. So Allah, Allah is the only one who can pay that back in full. So we ask, رَبِّ الْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا Like they took care of me, like they were in charge of raising me, and making sure of all of my needs are met when I was small. Now look at the profound nature of this dua. We want Allah to show our parents mercy the way they showed us mercy. You would expect tit for tat. I should show them mercy like they showed me mercy. But you know what the ayah is teaching us? I can never do enough for them in, in response, in proportion to what they did for me. Only Allah can do that. So, رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا Right? This is the, it's a profound dua, it's not something small. Show them mercy like they were Rabb over me. Now the word Rabb in, in fi'il form, tarbiya. This word comes from this, okay? Now, رَبَّ يَعْنِي They took care of me. 
This word in the past tense that's been used here, what does it mean? Allah Azza wa Jal is our, our Rabb. He's our Rabb. What does it mean? He's our sustainer, which means He provides for us and He allows us to exist from a moment to another. He takes care of every one of our needs. He's in complete charge over us. And in a limited, mortal sense, Allah gave that responsibility to who? Our parents. They were cleaning us when we couldn't clean ourselves, and feeding us when we couldn't feed ourselves, and clothing us when we couldn't clothe ourselves. They were there when we were in the most embarrassing, helpless situations. We were nothing more than animals. <laughs> you know, that they would take care of us. We would be completely, you know, we would cease to exist without their help. And they were there in that state for us. And when they reach a helpless state, what do we do? Put them in an old folks home. It's too hard to deal with them at home. It's too much work. Their temperament I can't handle. See, this is, this is great cruelty in our times. And our society, Muslim society understood, the easiest way to earn Jannah is good to your parents. So when they become old, it's more reason for you to be with them. And in modern times, what is it? When they become old, it's more reason for you to get away. <laughs> you know, stay away. Let's move to another state. I don't want to be around my parents. Because they'll keep calling every day. That's a good thing they'll keep calling. If they annoy you, congratulations, because you're fulfilling the ayah and you're not saying uff. You could say to Allah, I didn't say uff. Allah is giving you an opportunity to fulfill His word. So don't, take, don't think of it as something to complain about. Think of it as something to be grateful for. And finally, we end with the ayah, رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Your Lord, He knows best what you have in yourselves. And this nafs is usually used in terms of secret. Meaning, in on our tongue and to ourselves we can even lie, we can say, yeah, I take care of my parents. You don't have to tell me this, you're preaching the choir. I already do my job. But deep down inside you know that you're doing something bad, you're not doing enough. You and I know. Only one who knows that is you though. Because if somebody else asks you, you could say, I'm doing my job, I'm doing enough. I fulfilled my requirements. But Allah says, Allah knows best what is inside your nufus. In takunu salihin. If in fact you really are righteous in this context, in regards to this matter, if in fact you're doing the right thing with your parents, in the context of the ayat, fa inna hu kana lil awabina ghafura. For those who come clean, awab really the one who comes clean before Allah, admits his sins and makes tawbah. So if you want to be clean with Allah subhanahu wa taala, come clean and say, you know what, I messed up so far. I'm coming back to Allah Azza wa Jalla and I'm promising, I'm making a resolution, a Ramadan resolution, who needs a New Year's resolution? I'm making a Ramadan resolution that I'm going to correct my relationship with my parents and be the best I possibly can be with them. If I make that, then Allah says, for those people, Allah has always been exceedingly forgiving. Meaning Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala is still willing to overlook our flaw and is still willing to forgive us if we come clean before Him. If we admit to ourselves first, that we have missed out on taking care of our parents and then do everything we can for them. Now final piece of final piece of advice on this subject inshallah ta'ala especially for young brothers and sisters a lot of times you have situations where you're angry at your parents especially in our society here right the best thing to do to tackle that situation is actually to do the opposite execute your anger by doing something extra for your parents Buy your mother some flowers. Go vacuum her room. Do the laundry without being asked. Don't say it, and the younger guys here tell me, I clean up my room. You're not doing that for her. <laughs> That's for yourself. Clean up their room. Take the car to the car wash. Go do the groceries from Yoni. Do something for them. Something extra for them. Especially when they're extra mad at you. Even if you think they're wrong and you're right. Even then. Do something extra for them. And this will build inside you a high level of character. It will build inside you sabr, and it will build inside you forbearance, and it will build inside you good respect, nice respect for your parents. And in turn, Allah will soften their hearts towards you. And that's the, the other thing. If you respond with your mother's angry comments with anger, there's no way you're ever going to win. She's going to say, oh, you're so smart? Fine, you know what? I'm sorry, I didn't realize I raised a smarter child than myself. You're the best. You know, you want me to forgive? You want me, you want me to apologize to you? And she's going to, put you, you know, she's going to put herself down. And that's the worst thing you want. That's the last thing you want. So put yourself below. Lower your wings. Humble yourself. Allah tells us, the believers, to come to other believers with humility. Then imagine our parents. We have to be extremely, extremely humble to our parents. Full, knowing full well, they will say things 
that probably nobody else can dare say to you, but they will say them to you, because they know they can get away with it. I will bug my children, I'll tease my kids, it's just force of habit, I'll just tease them, because I can. I can't do it with other people's kids. But, and they'll say, Abbas, stop, but I won't stop, because I don't have to. <laughs> so yeah, parents will say things to test you, poke you. But that's just part of the perks of being a parent, let them. <laughs> you have to learn to deal with it. You have to learn to still smile in their face, and that's a good son and that's a good daughter. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us good sons and daughters, and grant us good sons and daughters. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.